So he he's the co-host of the Orange Pill podcast. He's also the Johnny Appleseed of Bitcoin, if you will. And uh, I we just did a show together at Adopting Bitcoin in El Salvador. Uh, let's please welcome him to the show, ladies and gentlemen, Max Kaiser. Hey, Graham. Graham. Nice to see you and finally get to be on your show. This is great. Yes. Thank you for joining us. Uh, um, so uh, I, I really wanted to have you on the show for several reasons. One, we talked like two years ago and you kind of predicted, you didn't use exact names, but you predicted what happened with FTX and these people like Sam Bankman fried and now CZ. And you tweeted out yesterday that he was one of the guys that you and Stacy, when you, when you got to El Salvador, were like, we don't want these kind of people coming into El Salvador and the shit coiners, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> that's what, that's what they're doing. That's what they're up to. So for those of you who don't know, um, I'll just tell you real quick what the happened is, uh, he's CZ, which is a settlement with the department of justice and the U S treasury. He has to, looks like a, $4.3 billion fine and he's stepping down and um, I don't know, he might be doing, it sounds like he's going to get a slap on the wrist. I don't know if he's going to do any actual time, but Max, you know, mm. you, you've been predicting these kind of people. And when I heard you and Stacy talk uh, at Pacific Bitcoin and also at adopting Bitcoin, you talked about like, we've been deliberately trying to keep these people out of El Salvador. And I didn't realize you were talking specifically about this guy. <laughs> so, how, how do you how do you see this? I mean, you, you you predicted this was happening. Are you shocked by these these the, the fines and everything, or how how do you see this? No, it's uh, it was all as you say. It's all very predictable. So, I mean, there's a couple of uh, points you make there. In in the case of El Salvador, the country made Bitcoin legal tender. And then Max and Stacy moved there and we went to work in helping the president create Bitcoin country. Mm -hmm. And so this meant, for example, passing some new laws, the new digital asset law, which states that Bitcoin is money and everything else is essentially an unregistered security. So we didn't uh, like to mint. We don't, we don't, um, waste time trying to wade through 10,000, 20,000 different shit coins and look at the nuance of this or the nuance of that. We're just saying that they're all unregistered securities and we're willing to make that statement because there's a lot of benefits to it. The SEC doesn't have really any guidance on these shit coins, these altcoins. They are making policy through enforcement, right? So every time they're, they're bringing a lot of people into court and they're suing them for doing things with their shit coins. Uh, but there's no real straightforward guidance from the SEC. Uh, but uh, so therefore, it's I think the laws in the U.S. are going to have to catch up to El Salvador because El Salvador is very clear. And um, so that's why El Salvador has had the full benefit of being Bitcoin maximalists. And there's a huge benefit to being just Bitcoin and Bitcoin only and keeping all the shit coins out. And we're seeing that benefit play out right now uh, with uh, lots of different things happening in El Salvador. And Bitcoin is a big part of it. Um, and as far as CZ goes, um, you know, he was trading shit coins on Binance. We've said all along that the SEC is eventually going to take them all down. They're all going to be in trouble. They're all going to be shut down eventually because they're all securities. They're all essentially unregistered securities. He's trading a bunch of unregistered securities. He's also engaging either allegedly or he's now been um, essentially um, pleaded guilty to mm -hmm. things like wash trading. You know, and wash trading is illegal, has been for a long time. Something like 50% of the volume on Binance is wash trading. Well, wash can you trading, explain what wash trading is real quick? Yeah, it's basically just your trade. The CZ was essentially trading with himself, so he's buying and selling the the coins in his own account to create the illusion of volume and to manipulate price. So that's illegal. And um, but 
uh, all exchanges to some degree, either th on purpose or sometimes through accident, end up engaging in wash trading. And but in this case, in the case of uh, Binance, uh, the report that came out recently shows that they were 50 percent of the volume is wash trading and wash trading. Now, another point about this, Graham, is that because they're such a big player in the space and because they're engaged in a lot of wash trading, the SEC has been dragging their feet on the, the ETFs, the exchange traded Bitcoin right. funds. And they keep saying that we, we're not happy with the price discovery. We're not happy with how price discovery is in Bitcoin. And what they're referring to is really CZ, who is a big player who's manipulating the price of Bitcoin through wash trading. So now that he has really been neutralized and taken out of the picture, these ETFs are going to go through. That so we have some some news on the gray, um, the GBTC from um, <laughs> from Barry Silbert. Uh, they're yeah, grayscale. And um, so they it looks like they're getting very close to being listed. The symbol, the trading symbol will be BTC, which is a great symbol. Uh, you know, all the, uh, the tens of thousands of stockbrokers in America and around the world will be able to call up their clients and say, you know, put some money into Bitcoin, put some money in, into BTC, this graystone ETF, grayscale ETF. And uh, so in the price is uh, looking really good. The, the the Binance news didn't hurt Bitcoin price at all. He was never in really a key figure in the Bitcoin space. He was always a key figure only in the shitcoin space. People say, oh, CZ helped people onboard people into crypto. Well, maybe he did, but all those people are going to jail. So he helped to onboard people into jail, right? So he, <laughs> he should get a prize from the National Prison Association or something because he created a lot of inmates <laughs> for these crypto traders. But he has he's not a Bitcoiner and he has no impact on Bitcoin and he had nothing to do with on, with onboarding anybody into Bitcoin, uh, minimally speaking. You know, he's one of many. He's just a minor player in, in all of this. And now he's gone and the price is going to rip higher because now we're going to have an ETF. And uh, this bad actor is being taken out, just like Sam Bankman Freed uh, was taken out. He was a very bad actor, uh, just like, you know, I could name 20 uh, people over the past uh, 10, 11, 12 years since we've been into Bitcoin uh, that emerged as bad actors and did bad things. Um, and now pretty much I think he was the last of the major bad actors. So he was kind of on the Sam Bankman Freed level. I don't see any other people of that scale, you know, doing shady things. So I think really now the decks are clear for this this really this bull market, this next phase in the Bitcoin bull market to get started and to really take us to the two hundred to three hundred thousand dollar coin level. Yeah, and it was so interesting too. Like a year ago, when CZ was like publicly battling with SBF, and I was like, so these guys, it's like two like rival gangs saying, "Well, you you cheated more than I cheated," or something. It was just it was fascinating to watch that. Um, yeah, there's and, a lot of uh, cross uh, trading amongst these players. They operate like a cartel. So um, um, any in any cartel, and you see these cartels often. You see, for example, the, in the gold trading business is run by a cartel. The bullion banks and the major gold gold players and gold miners have a cartel, and they manipulate prices, and they do so in ways that are provably illegal. Um, and there's always lawsuits being waged against them and they never it never seems to bother you know get in their way right because in the you know the law is uh very flexible and uh it applies to some people sometimes it depends on a lot of things like politics and other factors in the case of cz he was politically in a very bad place because he was interfering with Blackstone and all these major players on Wall Street who wanted to get their ETF listed and they wanted to start making money. So this guy was getting in their way. So they decided to charge him with stuff and to put him into the courtroom doing stuff that they do, right? They, they wash trading is done by this, these guys all the time. And all, all these illegal practices are done by all everybody all the time. And, uh, but, you know, it's convenient to be able to charge somebody with that when you need it to get to to service your own 
agenda. And so um, CZ is not one of the gang. He's not connected. He's not part of Wall Street. So they had to get rid of him. Do, do you think, I, I mean, ultimately it seems like, you know, all these ETFs, this BlackRock will, are going to be beneficial to the Bitcoin price and it'll drive the bull up. I, I, I just have some trepidations about BlackRock just internally, just as a company from what they do in terms of buying up houses and keeping them off the market to drive up rents and, and mortgages and stuff like that. Ultimately, how do you see BlackRock? So BlackRock's like, terrible. You know, right. they're one of the worst uh, players on Wall Street. They're completely without morals whatsoever. Um, their business model is just repackaging stocks and selling them as ETFs. You know, they own more, their, their ETFs own more stocks than there are stocks, right? They're just peddled there and they charge a fee for that. And they have incredible political influence that they use to make it easier for them to game the system. And, uh, they, um, are, um, really uh, a plague on capitalism, but, um, they become a useful idiot in this case. You know, th you know the thing about Graham, uh, Graham is that Bitcoin was really the first major financial play in history where the plebs got to get got to it first. Mm. Usually, it's the, it's the reverse. Wall Street makes their money, and then they sell off bits and pieces. Right? Companies go public, and the insiders make tons of money, and then the public can buy shares in the aftermarket. And they're, they're already the feast has already happened and they they can buy shares. But here in this case, the feast happened by the plebs, by the by the people who were marginally on the, the, the of society buying uh, Bitcoin when it was a dollar and five dollars and ten dollars. And now that it's getting close to 40,000, now you see Wall Street coming in. So it's really a, re a reverse of what we've seen historically with markets in that the little guy got there first and they've made a ton of money. And now Wall Street comes in and everyone's going to make a ton more money. So, yeah, BlackRock and all these other firms, Fidelity will launch ETFs and it'll bring in a tremendous amount of capital. And the product itself, the, the Bitcoin ETF is an inferior product to owning Bitcoin outright, right. just like the gold ETF is an inferior product to owning the gold outright, because in the gold ETF, if there's a, a credit problem with the custodian bank and they have to go bankrupt for some reason, they, you are, uh, it says in the fine print that they can settle with you, the, the ETF owner in cash. So you don't get gold for your gold ETF. You get paper money, which is the thing you're trying to avoid. Uh, same thing with a Bitcoin ETF. It'll have contingencies in the prospectus that make it a very much inferior to simply buying Bitcoin and putting it into cold storage and taking it out of the system. But nevertheless, it will unleash a lot of capital. And, you know, we're going to get to a valuation of Bitcoin, which would be similar to gold. So gold is in the 10 trillion uh, approximately market capitalization, the global gold stock that's traded. And Bitcoin is just under 1 trillion. So you're going to get a 10x on Bitcoin pretty quickly here. So you're talking 400,000 to compete with gold. Um, I think we could get it on this move. You know, you're going to get it definitely above 200, 250,000 on this, on this wave, on this move. If, will we get to 400,000 on this without a correction? And, you know, Bitcoin is corrects pretty severely every, every few years. Uh, possibly we'll have to see how it develops, but I, I have a feeling that because the fiat money world is collapsing so rapidly and the, the, the model of the nation state itself is collapsing that, you know, we could be pretty shocked on the upside in terms of where Bitcoin is going. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about the global, you know, as the fiat, you know, the BRICS nations are getting stronger and, you know, a conversation you and I had in El Salvador, you were telling me how Russia and well, China and Russia are the two top purchasers of gold over the last 20 years. And everyone's getting off of the dollar. And obviously in the long run, that's got to bode well for Bitcoin, but it could pose a short term like collapse that would bring the Bitcoin price down. Kind of like when, when um, COVID hit and the Bitcoin price dropped to whatever, under 4,000, but then within a year it was up you know, it's 50 or 60,000. How do you see the, 
with BRICS and all of this stuff, this, this global finance and the nation states going away and, and, and everybody getting off the dollar, how do you see that playing out in the next like 12 to well, 24 in, in dollar terms, the price of Bitcoin would go higher, right? If the, mm -hmm. if the dollar is going down, uh, your dollar price in Bitcoin goes up. So we very happy to see the dollar go down. Um, Bitcoin is already making new all time highs in currencies that are undergoing hyperinflation, you know, as we see in Argentina and, uh, Venezuela and Turkey, you know, in these places, Bitcoin is already hitting new all time highs because their local currencies are collapsing. The dollar is the, you know, it's the cleanest shirt at the laundry, right? It's, it's a fiat money, but it's on a relative to these other fiat monies. It's less the less worst option, but eventually it too will go the, this way of all fiat money. So fiat money is uh, we're at the end game for fiat money, which was like a 300 year experiment. And then in 1971, of course, we, we went on all fiat money for the world when Nixon closed the gold window here in the United States. So this is uh, all winding down. We're not, we're not, we're, we're moving toward a post fiat money, post central bank, post nation state world and gold will have a place in that world and countries like we said china russia and others are aggressively buying gold you know central banks still settle in gold and um gold will still be around and it'll still have a bid and people will still buy it and it'll still be a safe haven play but as paul tudor jones has said you know the, all the dynamics that go in the macro economic dynamics that go into analyzing and projecting where the prices of these things are going he likes inflation hedges he says yeah gold of course is a classic inflation inflation hedge but bitcoin is the fastest horse in the race and you know i'm looking at the the numbers here myself and i'm figuring for every dollar move in gold up you're going to get 30 to 40 dollars in bitcoin so mm -hmm. you know it's a supercharged way to play the collapse of the fiat money world which includes the dollar you know the dollar is is really in jeopardy the, the 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 country the united states is printing money just to pay the interest on the debt just the interest right so that's debt monetization in a debt spiral and there the gdp is not going to suddenly go up 50x to create the, enough tax revenue to pay down that debt mm -hmm. that in fact the gdp is shrinking the the amount of the, you know the 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 dynamics are horrible for the the fundamentals of the US dollar are terrible and well the, everyone who's got a portfolio and there's about 100 trillion dollars under management by portfolio managers around the world and uh, that game is basically asset allocation you know you're allocating your portfolio to avoid risk and get the biggest return you can and the dollar is being downsized. People are moving out of the dollar. They're moving into Bitcoin. Bitcoin is now considered to be a safe haven. It's considered to be a, a, a risk off investment, which is incredible because when we started back in 2011, when it was a dollar, it was considered to be the most speculative play in history, right? And now it's considered to be the safest asset in the world, safer than bonds. It's less volatile than bonds. In 2023, safer than the property market. Property market's collapsing. Look at all these commercial real estate deals oh, every day. Yeah. Washington, D.C., uh, all these New York City, you know, these huge office buildings that were bought for $300 million are going on sale for $30 million. It's like the biggest markdown in commercial real estate. It's, it's unbelievable. And of course, that commercial real estate is the collateral that holds together all the banks that make all those loans. That's their primary business is making real estate loans so that means the balance sheet of all the major banks are severely impaired which means they're going to have to get a massive bailout which means going further into debt which means interest rates are going to go even higher which means the dollar is going to be continuously under attack and nobody wants the dollar nobody wants the u.s treasury bonds and into this mix is bitcoin as a safe haven play it separates money from state it's unconfiscatable it's cheap relative to gold way cheap relative to gold mm -hmm. and it's cheap relative to the bond market the global bond market is it's still incredibly cheap relative to what you could call the total addressable market a tam total addressable market for bitcoin is 400 trillion 
because that's the total size of the pot of financialized assets on planet Earth. And that's it's everything on planet Earth that's traded is heading towards zero against Bitcoin because Bitcoin becomes the global reserve standard. So, you know, the banks, like you said, they've got all this money in commercial real estate and they feel like the banks are going to go belly up. Although Joe Biden in the spring said your money's safe. So that made me feel good. Joe Biden said that that's like the, just the tip of, <laughs> of, of anytime somebody says your money's fine. I was like, Oh my God, get it out, get it out of the banks immediately. The, as the nation states collapse and America is like the biggest one and it's a collapsing empire. I'm, I'm a little worried of like, ultimately I see Bitcoin winning in this and you and others have helped me become like a full on Bitcoin maximalist. But how do you see the United States as it starts collapsing? Are they going to do some crazy stuff? Like, because you've got Gary Gensler who knows exactly what Bitcoin is. And yet he, he, he says he, he doesn't know what it is or whatever. And I think I saw Kathy Wood recently say she thinks he's making a move to be Secretary of Treasury. Anyway, but how, how do you see this American collapsing empire? It is collapsing. It's not will it collapse. It is collapsing. It's just how deep will the collapse go? How far will it go? But how is America going to react to this? Poorly. In your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the reaction is going to be bad. It's already, you already see signs of it because the collapse is happening. It's just not evenly distributed. So in cities like Chicago and 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 in other cities, they're already in free fall. They're already looting, mass looting on the streets, mass, you know, violence. It's already become road warriors in a lot of places already in the United States. So and that's that's growing. And people are leaving. You know, they it's what's amazing with El Salvador is actually they're experiencing reverse migration. There's more people fleeing to El Salvador. Now they're migrating to El Salvador as economic freedom, as a safe, secure environment with a president who is a visionary and a great leader, right? These are all very attractive attributes, all very great bullet points why you would go and live in a country uh, with all these opportunities, there are strong opportunities there. And so, the, you know, the SEC and Gary Gensler, um, you know, they've been trying i think to as i said earlier they needed to get finance and cz out of the way before they let the um spot market ets for b for bitcoin trade and um so they they they, they were successful in doing that um and um the um you know in the us you have something like 90 percent of the wealth is now concentrated in five percent of the population or less and that that trend toward feudalism is getting sharper so mm -hmm. you'll have 99 percent of the wealth will be in the hands of 0.01 percent of the population so you're back to feudalism you're back to lords and serfs so you'll have then those people will build very tall walls and they'll live behind in those gated communities with their own armed militias. And they'll have everything that they, they need inside the castle and everyone outside of the castle, you know, will be, um, in a very bad state, you know, but uh, that seems to be the trend and they own, there's no political will to fight that the, the, the political, the way to, to get the population to sign on to that, is twofold. Number one, they'll bring in C CDBC, CBDC, central bank digital currencies. So the way that they'll do that is they'll say, oh, hey, you've got $10,000 in your account. We're going to convert that to a CBDC and give you 100000 of the CBDC. And you're like, wow, that's awesome. I'll take 100000 of your CBDC. Thank you. But, you know, within six months, the purchasing power of that 100000 in CBDC will be less than the purchasing power of the 10,000 you gave up to get the CBDC. You'll be a lot poorer because they'll print at an accelerated rate. The CBDC will be printed at 10 to 20 times uh, the rate that they're even printing the dollar. So it's is a recipe toward hyperinflation and it's a very strong surveillance technology. So it'll be impossible to, to really not be 
part of what I call the casino gulag at that point, where people are basically chained to online platforms playing video games for a few points to swap out for a CBDC coin to buy a protein pill to stay alive another day. It's really like a prison. You know, it's an electronic prison, uh, but it's, it looks like a casino. So it's like Las Vegas, but you're, you can't leave the slot machine. You're, it, you, you can't leave. You ha the only way you can get a protein pill is to stay there and keep clicking on the fruit machine. That's it. Which a lot of people do. You know, if you go to Vegas and you see people oh. banging those fruit machines, like they're doing it, like they're already z zombies in some kind of quasi conscious state of narcolepsy or whatever. So just that'll be applied toward 200 million people. And they'll all be playing the America casino game in the casino gulag. And they'll be, you know, the, the guys at the top will be living in their castles and flying around. And, but it, that's, that's the transition that's happening right now. Yeah. So there's no political agenda to stop it. Certainly not on the, the democratic side. They're the worst offenders, right? They, they believe that all politics is based on, um, you know, cultural agenda, uh, identity politics yeah. is all their politics. And that, of course, is is the same thing as Mao Zedong. That was this cultural revolution that if we all wear little green jackets and carry a little red book, everyone will be happy. That's the Democrats are essentially Maoists in America, and they are trying to impose communism. And um, it's it's working right so joe biden is like a demented version of mao zedong essentially he seems more like a reagan republican to me <laughs> like he seems he seems well i mean the the, the i mean you know the reg anyway you know that's that's a bit of a see, see reagan you know i can talk differently about reagan and, and and because it's a slightly different story but um so therefore since they control the narrative in the media pretty much you know, um, people are like unaware of this, that's that it's happening. They're, they're, they're kind of just sleepwalking into this neo communism. So there's no, there's no, um, pushback really. Uh, uh, and, and so, okay. On the right. Okay. Now you're talking Republicans. So then, you know, you, you're going to be talking the Republican party and Trump and Reagan and stuff. I mean, that's a different political, uh you know approach you know i th this is more i for me i'll say i identify more with the that that side of the aisle i don't identify mm -hmm. with the left side of the aisle i'm much more on the right side of the aisle um so i know that um in this space you know the liberal comedian space um there's there's a pushback against um the right wing side of things but uh, never, you know, I'm I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, yeah, I'm always willing to learn. You know, maybe I'm missing something. But uh, uh, you know what I'm saying? Like Jimmy Dore, you know, Jimmy Dore is still really hoping that the left, the liberals, the progressives, you know, get something done. You know, and it's very admirable that he would have those feelings, but. At what point do you say it's I got to take a different approach? It's not going to ever happen. It's not going to happen. Um, and there's you got to look at the other side of the aisle for and, and start considering some things that they have been saying that maybe you have been um, overlooking, uh, sadly, because uh, look, now let's go to Argentina. Right. So Argentina just elected uh, a new president, Javier Miel. Mm -hmm. And he is very much in this new post nation state, post central bank, post fiat money mold, which is more on the Ron Paul uh, side of the equation. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let me address a couple of things here. So, so for me, I, I'm, I don't call myself liberal at all. I'm an anti-war pro labor socialist. I think the two party system is awful. I don't like the Democrats. I don't like the Republicans. And I, I have given up any hope that there's going to be some left revolution. I'm the America's done. I just tell people buy Bitcoin and grow your own food. But, um, so I just want to say that, um, 
And I, you know, I think Amer I think that's that's the if you follow the money, both parties, you know, they both support war. They both support Wall Street bailouts. It's a well, let, let me jump in here again for a second. Okay. So, um, when talking about the left, essentially, what you're talking about is labor. Mm -hmm. Okay, that labor, the labor force, needs representation in government and they need representation in the economy and they need organized labor and they need someone fighting for them for higher wages and the issue is that either one of a couple things can work either you have um a central bank like the federal reserve bank and you have a very strong organized labor force. So in other words, the central bank works for the oligarchs and organized labor would work for labor and that the labor would, are, would fight to have their wages tied to money supply. So the, so the average hourly wage right now would be closer to 50 to $60 an hour to, to keep pace with the amount of money that goes into Wall Street's pockets. Okay, that, that's one system. That, that could work. Or you could have no central bank and you have no organized labor this would be more of a free market system and um that would also work it has its pluses and minuses but it would also work the worst possible combination would be that you have a central bank and you have no organized labor which is what you have in the united states right now right right and that's the worst yes so and then labor has no will have no ability to fight the central bank by lobbying for higher wages and higher benefits and by getting the democratic side to give them more food stamps that will never equal the playing field their only way to equal this playing field is to get onto bitcoin if you by essentially walking away from the entire fiat money system central banking system and going on a on a big on a bitcoin standard and we already see this what's going on in el salvador as a good example of what happens when you go on a bitcoin standard president Bukele just gave a brilliant speech where he's saying that you know he was told when he came into office that if he got rid of the gangs he would kill the economy because the gangs are a central part of the economy there's also not only the gangs themselves who are extorting billions and then recycling that into the economy but there's the families that they support and then there's a, a lot of uh, ancillary jobs that go into uh, the whole gang economy so you know his decision was that i'm unwilling to accept that i I'm, I'm going to get rid of the gangs i'm going to take crime out of the gdp figures and he did and guess what the economy actually went up because now you've got people on the streets without fear who are assembling, getting together, creating new companies, creating jobs in the economy, tourism's up, companies are moving in. I mean, they thought in El Salvador they would have one or two years of down economic downturn, but in fact, they had no economic downturn. It's been straight up. So uh, you don't need to have an economy run by crooks is the, is the message. You know, in the UK, for example, I'll give you an example, a few years ago, the UK decided that, you know what, our debt to GDP doesn't look very attractive. We have too much jet debt and not enough GDP. So the exchequer of the exchange is going to incre is going to include now both heroin sales and prostitution in our GDP. So that it looks so the debt will look smaller. Right. <laughs> and that's that was a public policy. That was a policy that they put forward and stated it as such that prostitutes are hardworking. And you know we should include them in GDP. Heroin users are helping to support their communities. We should include <laughs> that in GDP. So this is what this is this is the strange world we live in, where um, there's no differentiation in the economy between somebody looting nine hundred dollars at Target and somebody paying for something for nine hundred dollars at Target, because at the end of the day they're just triggering a nine hundred dollar bailout in one shape or another more money printing and then you've got this titanic size problem sinking into the sea of fiat money abyss 
And okay, so the left is completely incapable of doing anything. On the right, you know, I think that's the only place you're going to find some smart people stepping forward. That's where you find most of the Bitcoin support, you know, putting, let's say, RFK aside for a second. You know, Robert Kennedy Jr. is come out. You know, he's been talking about Bitcoin. He understands Bitcoin. But now he's an independent because he couldn't get any uh, hearing in the Democratic Party. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, mostly it's on, on the right. And, and this is global, a global phenomenon. It, it's it hues toward hard money. It's a hard money standard, a hard money economy, a gold better than gold, having a gold money uh, standard. And and so that's where the answers are, because. There's no answers on the left anymore. I mean, this is where Javier in, in Argentina, you know, he is incredibly animated when he talks about the quote unquote libtards and, you know, socialist as scum. And now these are his words. He's completely attacking the left and the liberals and the progressives and with a chainsaw, you know, like he's going to take a chainsaw and just and, and cut this cancer of 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 their of their socialist agenda out of the economy and that that won him the election and um if you look at it in terms of bitcoin it starts to make some sense right and uh, anyway so that's my my answer to that <laughs> so <laughs> well let me address a couple of things here I think, yeah, there is no real left in America anymore. It's a, the, the Democratic Party is not the left. They're a corporate, you know, they're a, it's part of the kleptocracy. So Malay is an interesting guy. I talked about him on my show the other day. I think for Bitcoin, if Argentina goes to Bitcoin, I think that's a very good thing. The, the, the concern I have with him is he's, he's pro-Israel and he's pro-Israel is a, that's part of the war machine. That's part of the military industrial complex and which is part of the central banks. The central banks fund the war machine. And so that that a Bitcoin president in El Salvador, that overall is a good thing. This particular guy, I don't know. I I, I don't know that I'm I'm that excited about him. And with regard to why the well, Bitcoin he says a lot of things. He says he's an expert in tantric sex. Right. He his key. What he learned from Donald Trump is that the way to get through the the gatekeepers in the media world is by hitting them with a barrage of insanity. Right. And he says things that are clearly insane, but they're also within that context. He's saying some truths about the economy, which is what I focus on. And uh, because he's got like two or three advanced degrees in economics and he worked at very high levels as an economic advisor. His he is comes from the uh, Hayek school mm -hmm. of uh, Austrian econ economics and He's incredibly articulate on the subject and he knows what he's talking about. Everything else that's not related to the economics and uh, looking at Bitcoin, uh, I ignore because I don't think it's going to be relevant. You know, they, I have said that you don't change Bitcoin, Bitcoin changes you, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it has this ability to, to change people once they start thinking about it, once they start using it. And I think that'll be the case in Argentina. The the only risk that I see is that the shit coiners show up like uh, Coinbase and Brian Armstrong and uh, these others, uh, Jeremy Allaire uh, at uh, Circle. And those guys are on the level of uh, CZ or um, mm -hmm. Sam Bankman Free. They're incredibly bad actors and they're destructive. And um, they, but they have the, you know, as all con men do, they have a way of warming their way into situations. So Hopefully he can avoid, you know, getting uh, attacked by those folks. You know, we're working to kind of get a, a mission to Argentina to representing what's been going on in El Salvador and, and talking about w what we feel would be the, the right course of action would be to set up a similar perimeter to keep out the shit coins because there's no incremental gain you're going to get from a shit coiner that would be worth sacrificing the brand value of being Bitcoin maximalist, right? So Bitcoin maximalism as a brand carries with it incredible benefits that no incremental gain from some minor shitcoin can ever hope to bring to upset that equation. And so we're hoping to make that voyage, um, you know, hopefully soon. Yeah, I think it, I think, yeah, I, 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 my thing where I, I study history a lot. And so the, the economic, 
depression of the 30s brought about a lot of right wing populism because the liberals did nothing and they allowed this crap to happen. So I, I worry about right wing populism going into the fascism of like Mussolini and whatnot. Um, and because the, the liberals are doing nothing, the Democrats, they, they, it's like Chris Hedges book. Death yeah, of the well, there's right wing populism, which and fascism, which is the merging of corporations with the state. And um, it's but that's not the part of the right wing I'm talking about. I'm talking sure. about the Ron Pauls of the world and others who have spoken about the central bank. And and ultimately, that would extend to the benefits of decentralization. You know, fascists would not be for decentralization, right? They're for a centralized power. Right. And Bitcoin is decentralized money. It would be anti-fascist. It would be anti-right-wing extremism. It's anti-authoritarianism. You know, it's jokingly, jo it's a joke when people in the mainstream press refer to President Bukele as an authoritarian in some way or a dictator in some way. No dictator would allow, make Bitcoin legal tender and allow six and a half million of the population to become individually sovereign with unconfiscatable yeah. money. That would be the complete opposite of a dictator. Yeah. You know, this is a liberator. This is somebody who wants the people to express their best selves, you know, in, in a way that helps the community and creates a feedback loop that's positive. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think there's needs to be a little bit of nuance, um, you know, when you're using, you know, the broad strokes of right, left, Demo you know, uh, mm -hmm. liberals and, and, and conservatives. I'm, what I'm saying about the conservatives are that the, within the conservatives are the hard money crowd, the Bitcoin crowd, the Ron Pauls, the audit the Fed crowd, the people who are saying right. that fiat money is really the root of the problem. If you go back to Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Wall Street, which was kind of a left wing phenomenon, yes. you know, they rightfully pinned the blame on Wall Street. OK, I mean, because because that's the root of all of the problems is, is the money printing. But um, they, the, the extension of that, the way to take it deeper is to look at what drives Wall Street, and that is the dollar and fiat money. So anyone who was doing Occupy Wall Street should be, uh, you know, all about getting on the Bitcoin uh, train. You know, uh, you, you know, our friend um, Lee, what's his I, I mean, Camp. Lee Camp, right? You know, Lee Camp is like he came out of Occupy Wall Street. You know, that was the, he made his bones on Occupy Wall Street. And, uh, you know, he, he, we were talking to him about Bitcoin forever. You know, he's not jumping on it. Uh, Tim Pool got him on it a little. I got him on it a little. Tim Pool, you know, he's been circling the Bitcoin, um, you know, for, for years now. He, he's not willing to come down to El Salvador and actually, if he got an open invitation, uh, you know, Joe Rogan, I, 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 why is he, is he playing dumb? What's the wrong with Joe Rogan? I mean, he's a smart guy. Why would he be so tone deaf when it comes to, to Bitcoin? Um, you know, where, where are these people? And, uh, and the fact is that they're missing the boat. They're going to miss it. They're going to be left holding their dick, basically. So not to put too fine a point on it, but you know, they're going to be out there, you know, nothing. They got nothing. And it's all oh, the parties moving to El Salvador. That's where the party is. It's got hey. Bitcoin. It's got the beach. It's got volcanoes. It's got Max and Stacy. It's got President Bukele. It's got the Miss Universe contest. It's got pretty. It's got pupusas. You know, three for a dollar. You could live. You, you could have feed yourself and your family for fifty cents. I'm coming down in February. Like I'm making the move. So I I, let, I want to talk about this and then I'll let you go. But I you bring up so many interesting points here. And this is the problem I have with lefties, is. They don't, to me, Bitcoin is this lefty socialist movement. It's this thing, anyone can own it. It's the thing that takes away the central banks. It depowers the Wall Street. It, it takes away the war machine. And a lot of progressive lefties are like, oh no, it's, they, don't, they don't get it. Like I keep telling them, they're like, oh, it's another scam thing. I go, there's no Bitcoin CEO that's gonna get arrested. And I see it as this tool that would help an activist movement. Like if, if, Again, like all these Occupy people, some of them I know got into Bitcoin and they saw it because like WikiLeaks was getting paid in Bitcoin when they got their PayPal money taken away and all this stuff. And I'm trying to get this message across to lefties of why they should 
buy Bitcoin. I lost my house in the 2008 housing crisis. I lost in 2010. I got That's one of the things that woke me up. I got screwed over. I saw Bush and Obama bail out the banks and I found out how it was so corrupt and they allowed these banks to steal my home. And it was, it was, it was gnarly. And so that's why I've been such on a Bitcoin, hey, buy Bitcoin and get out of it. But I don't know how to communicate to the left. Well, you know, stuff. you're making an excellent point that it, it, this is tailor made for the left, right? It, it, yeah. Everything the left is talking about there that they're concerned about with is Bitcoin would it would facilitate their their agenda. It, it, yeah. and, uh, absolutely. It, it, you know, AOC uh, or these folks, um, they don't understand that Bitcoin is how they would fulfill their agendas. What they're hoping to accomplish as politicians, they can do it via Bitcoin, right? Um, I mean, you're making an excellent point. It is, you know, ultimately it goes back to, you know, Bitcoin is an open source project, mm -hmm. right? And open source is in the technology field is a, is a, is an innovation, a, a revelation, you know, Linus Torvald with Linux, you know, Linux is an open source software protocol that eventually, you know, replaced Microsoft in many instances. Um, it's because you've got the power of the crowd and the crowd is, would be, you could replace crowd with community, you know, you, or the, the, the society, right? I mean, the lefties are saying we we want we want to protect the society. We, we want to protect everyone, the least advantaged, the 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 the, lo the lowest income. Well, you do that through open source projects where nobody has a strategic advantage over everybody else, and that's what Bitcoin is. You know, it's not proof of stake. Where well, proof of stake, like in the fiat money world, the more money you have, the more ability you have to to make policy to influence. So the game is to make as much money and then change the law to make it easier for you to make more money. And then ultimately the least advantage or the people who don't have a lobbyist working for them in Washington lose, they lose out. And then the lefties come along and say, we need to make it fair by giving them some money. We're going to print some money and give it to them to make it fair. But unfortunately that crowds out legitimate investment and legitimate entrepreneurialism, which is not getting funded the way it should be, which would create the jobs and the opportunities in a more fair way. <laughs> so that's where the equanimity comes in is would be fairness of opportunity, not fairness and outcome. You cannot dictate outcome. You can only dictate opportunity. I mean, and, and um, so this is what the left is completely missing the boat. You know, Cenk Uger, uh, oh. over there. I mean, this guy <laughs> is so far off, off the map, you know, he's, he's, he's just completely missed the boat. Oh. Um, but you know, with, with Bitcoin, there's, um, you know, there is, um, people anyway, I'll, 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 I'll go ahead. Go ahead. Move, move, let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. <laughs> you know, let's move on. Well, I really appreciate it. I mean, the thing that was so cool about being uh, adopting Bitcoin, you know, I was like the only comedian there and it was all these tech and finance people, which is awesome. But the thing that I love about the Bitcoin community is everybody comes from all these different places, different walks of life, different political backgrounds. It's largely a lot of conservative and libertarian, but everyone wants to come. The majority of the people are coming in looking for solutions. And, and they're like, this is how Bitcoin can fix this problem and this problem and this problem and this problem. And that's what I love about it. And then ultimately, nobody's nobody's got a problem with me because I have a different point of view than a lot of the people there. They're just like, oh, they're listening to what I'm saying. We have a discussion, maybe even a little debate. But at the end of the day, we both love Bitcoin and we see the power. We see how it can change things for the better. So as we've seen that, so we, we, what, what Bukele has done is amazing. I've been down to El Salvador twice now. And it's, I mean, when I was there in June to where I was just there, you know, two weeks ago, I saw new roads built in El Zante, which is Bitcoin beach. And I, like that, it's just, the, the progress is, is stunning with possibility of Argentina going Bitcoin. I see this as a, like, like El Salvador was the first domino to fall to where more of it looks like Central and South America, Latin America in general, are going to start going to Bitcoin. Where else do you see 
I mean, what other countries do you think in the short run are going to probably adopt the Bitcoin standard? Right. Well, it's proving to be a vote getter, right? So the Argentine election, you know, part of getting votes was to to adopt a Bitcoin policy. It's been a huge goat vote winner in El Salvador. And I think so. You're right. In the region, Central America, Latin America, it'll be people are starting to wake up to the politics of Bitcoin that you can get in, you can win elections mm -hmm. with a Bitcoin policy and, and, and a security policy, pretty much the formula that was mapped out in El Salvador. And it's a huge winning formula. The president, Bukele, has got a 93% popularity rating, the highest in the world. It's the highest I've ever seen in my years observing these things. And um, so he's clearly got a good policy mix and it's security, uh, economic freedom, Bitcoin, and uh, and, the, and the rest of it. So that will definitely resonate throughout the, the region. Um, and then you have, you know, pockets uh, where things are popping up. So um, a politician in Germany just recently came out and they said they want to push a Bitcoin agenda. You've got, uh, so in Europe, all over Europe, it's, it's differently. The, the countries where the, the currency is deteriorating, you have more emphasis to solve the inflation problem with Bitcoin. So you're going to have, that will be where things perk up. In economies that are centralized, highly centralized, like China, um, it would be less of an issue because they are very much a very centralized command and control economy. So that's not going to be uh, in the works. Although when China and Russia and Iran are now doing a lot of trading deals, they are walking away from the dollar and they're trading in their own currencies and they're going to trade in gold and they'll probably trade in Bitcoin on the, 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 the sovereign level. Um, and that will trickle down to the individual level at some point. Again, because once you start to get into go down the Bitcoin path, it just gets makes more and more sense. The more you study it, the more you use it, the, the more you realize how antiquated and ridiculous the current system is. Mm -hmm. And this affects everybody. So, I mean, as far as having different different um, you know uh, folks coming into the Bitcoin space of different political persuasions or different philosophies, ultimately. We all have faith that the Bitcoin is on its own vector. It doesn't need us and it's taking us to a place we want to be because nobody has any control over Bitcoin. It's on its own path. It's taking us somewhere. It, it was the really the discovery of this protocol, which is the discovery of perfect money. And that has impacted our societies and our even our 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 species of i mean you can say that the same way let's say the 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 discovery of fire you know had a profound impact on human uh the printing press the electric light these things have profound impacts on us as a species as a culture as a as a population and you know it changes the direction the path that we're on the the path that bitcoin is on is on it's on a unique path where um, it, it, it gets, it crosses over from the physical world into the spiritual world in a lot of ways. You know, um, I was talking to Jimmy Song um, recently, who wrote, he's been writing some great books, including Thank God for Bitcoin. And he made the point that um, the concept of money is, is already an abstract concept to begin with, and that when you use gold, you know, gold is a physical representation of an abstract concept. But when you get into Bitcoin, it's it's an abstract, more abstract, which is more in keeping with our, our, our psyches in our communal understanding of what money is to begin with. So it's actually we're getting we're getting back to the beginning with Bitcoin. It's it's almost like the, the big bang of our consciousness is being restarted. Yeah, you know, we're being reset. The humanity is being they hit the reset button because under the fiat money standard and the gold standard humanity was heading toward extinction i would say it's just the it's just the incentives driving the global economy were horrible so the environments were collapsing um the biological the biospheres are, are collapsing um the ability to maintain billions of people on the planet is not working and just it, it was the whole thing is collapsing it needed to be reset so so bitcoin is that reset button 
and we're pretty young into it. We're only 13, 14 years into it. But now I think the next five to 10 years, you'll see that, you know, that hockey stick moment where you go from kind of grinding along to suddenly, you know, it, it, it takes a quantum leap and there's huge change in people's consciousness. You know, what is, what, what is money? And I've said that Bitcoin demonetizes violence and war because if it's unconfiscatable, it's foolish to come at me with an army to try to take my Bitcoin because no, no, matter, no, matter, no, no amount of violence or coercion will separate me from my private keys because if, if they're properly stored, it's unconfiscatable. You know, you, you, there's nothing to do. So the idea of maintaining standing armies becomes kind of foolish because, you know, um, you, you can't, you can't take the property. The property is unconfiscatable. So you, the only way you can get some of their, some of my Bitcoin is to come to me and say, Oh, I want you to sell, uh, have some art I'd like you to buy, or I have a service that you need and I'll, and I'll do it for Bitcoin. So that's peace. So it monetizes peace. It monetizes love where, and it demonetizes war. So that's, that's, that's the fact. And that's an economic reality. And it's tied to the thing that people deal with every second of their lives. Every second of your life, there's somebody sending you a bill somewhere, some insurance company, some streaming service, some you know bank. Then there's a bill heading your way. And then every moment you check your thing, your iPhone, it's a bing. You know, you've got another charge, right? So mm -hmm. that is draining, draining our collective consciousness to the point of, of becoming collectively brain dead, you know, humans, the walking corpses, the Aldous Huxley version of Brave New World, where we're just on the Soma and the Casino Gulag, and we're effectively collectively dead. Bitcoin fixes this and re it resets. It goes back to the individual and individual responsibility and individual personality and individual freedom. You know the, the the and but it does so in this decentralized way, in this open source way. So in a lot of ways, you know, it's interesting. There's there's a lot of paradoxes within the the Bitcoin ecosystem, and in this way, it rep, it reflects some of the finest art and poetry that we have created over the millennia. Uh, our species it is full of paradox and and simile and and metaphor, and you, you know this is how we get along through life is by differentiating between light and dark and between right and wrong. And, you know, we're constantly making these thoughts in our head and how do we fit? So, so Bitcoin having a Bitcoin standard means you have a one global measure of truth. Everyone maps to that truth. So it doesn't matter what your political beliefs are, as long as you have some mapping to the Bitcoin standard, you and I can have a conversation because we have some commonality. Everyone mm -hmm. ultimately will have some degree of commonality. Whereas today in a fiat money world, we have um, fanatical opposition and no commonality. The, the, the people who are, at, who are killing each other this month <laughs> consider themselves to have no commonality. They consider themselves to be mutually exclusive. You know, this world's not big enough for both of us. So right. one of us has to die. Right. So that's there's no commonality whatsoever. But that's a fiat money system, because every time you make a mistake in a fiat money world, you can just print more money. And if you're the person printing the money, then you can take the moral high road and say, well, I'm right because I'm printing the money. Right. That that proves I'm right, because look at my bank account. I've got all this printed money in my bank account. That means I'm right. That's my righteous. Mm -hmm. That's my moral prerogative. I'm right because I have a lot of printed money. And so the other side says, oh yeah, well, we're gonna print a lot of money. Okay, so now what happens? Well, you have inflation, <laughs> right? So then that's, inflation just broke out and it's not gonna go down anytime soon because you've got people at war, ultimately the weapon they have choice is money printing. Right. The Pentagon is a giant money printer it sucks up 50% of our tax revenue to support nuclear subs, you know, 
in the middle of the ocean to go sail around um, to try to defend property that's indefensible when you compare it to Bitcoin, which is actually the only true property that's unconfiscatable, separates money from state. So this is all, these are all changes that are happening. And this is what the institutional money is realizing, the Black Rocks and these other folks about Bitcoin. And so you're going to see a rotation out of these other assets like stocks and bonds and property and gold. They all get demonetized. All that flows into Bitcoin. And the Bitcoin price continues to head toward a million, two million, five million. And all these other things just continue to be um, demonetized and uh, end up like the Venezuelan Boulevard, just litter, garbage in the street that people just, you know, use it to, as, uh, to line their cat boxes. You know, it's cat, cat litter, essentially. And you're wrapping fish in this stuff. It's, no, it's worthless stuff. It's just, it's, it's ridiculous. You know, I would tear some up right now, but I don't have any handy. But <laughs> usually at this point, I start tearing up paper money and I'm like, hey, it's worthless. But, you know, it is. There's nothing to it. Well, Max, this is awesome, man. I love having you on the show. Thank you for taking time. I know it's like a holiday week and everything and 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 explaining this. And uh, it's important for my audience to hear. My audience, like I said, I really want lefties to wake up to this thing because to me, it's a tool for lefty activism. But um, I love how you explain it and, and everything that that you're saying, I totally resonate with because just these Pacific Bitcoin and adopting Bitcoin conference, hanging out with all these Bitcoiners, I see this, what you're talking about. There's this, all this artwork. People have all this creative. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, so art, you know, typically all the lefties like to go to museum of modern art and drink some wine and eat, eat some brie and talk about, you know, Kant and, uh, you know, uh, Keynes and um, Paul Krugman in the New York times and uh, there's plenty of that going on in Bitcoin. You know, if you want to see art and, and drink wine and eat uh, French cheese, you can do so in Bitcoin. We're not going to throw you out. You can, be, <laughs> you can be a culture snob and read the New York Times. We're not going to hold that against you because we know that if you're in a Bitcoin room that you have some hope. There's some hope yet for you. you know, Even though you're in the Washington Post hope. and you're degenerate and, and, and a parasite, <laughs> and uh, brain fogged and d tone deaf, you know it's okay. You, you're welcome into our into our room, and because you understand at least the beginning of Bitcoin, you're willing to take. You know, I started Shitcoiners Anonymous. Yes, you know, for these yes. Shitcoiners, for like, uh, you know, Bitboy is this guy. He's a classic <laughs> Shitcoiner Anonymous. Like, oh, you know, it, it, the Shitcoiners are they're just. They need to. They need to uh, go to shitcoiners anonymous. You know, they they're addicted to the shitcoins. Yeah. And and they act out and they lose it all. They just lose it all. And so you see it all time and time again. But and I the the point is not to try to. You have to. They have to. You know, hit bottom with their shitcoins. Yeah. And then and then they maybe they'll 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 the, from there they can they can they can enter shitcoiners anonymous, and 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 recover. They can recover from their shikoinery, right? But so yeah, I mean that's one of my major contributions to this to this <laughs> industry is to recognize that the shikoiners they're not just wrong; they're they have a disease. Yeah, shikoining is a disease. It's, it's not just bad technology. It's not just bad incentives. It's not just crooks and greedy people. That they have a disease, and we shouldn't hold that against them, especially when there's help available. At shitcoiners and autos. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great that God can grant you the serenity to accept the fact that shitcoins are bad. <laughs> oh yeah, well, I, I I have a whole twelve steps I laid out, you know, and uh, I, I I read it out at the uh, the event that we were both at. Yes. And uh, where was that anyway? Adopting Bitcoin. I was adopting Bitcoin. The comedy show at adopting Bitcoin. You where where that? was that? That was in El Salvador. That was oh right, El Salvador, and uh, that was great. You know, we um, I think a lot of people are were happy to hear that path being built out of the of their darkest hour. <laughs> they should re remake that movie, Lost Weekend. That <laughs> was you know, shitcoiners. Was a shitcoiner. You know, they're hiding shitcoins in in under the bed. You know. They're trying to keep their shit coining secret from their family. They lose it all. They're on the street. 
You know, he could get Big Boy. I'm sure he would play the lead in Lost Weekend, the shitcoin version, and get him for like 10 bucks because he's flat broke now because of his shitcoining. Yeah, because he lost his Lamborghini. All he's got is a, a fanny pack. Yeah. <laughs> well, this was awesome, Max. I really appreciate you coming on the show. It was great seeing you come up to in, in, in El Salvador. I will be back there, and I'm going to come down and stay a lot longer. And yeah. there's all that stuff you and I talked about. I'm I'm, I'm working on all that. So, um, so thank you to you and Stacy and everybody in El Salvador because it's it's truly amazing. I truly, I travel a lot and I've been to a lot of countries just in the last couple of years. And El Salvador is like one of the only places where there's hope. I mean, it's mm. really no, it's palpable there. And it's not just the Bitcoiners that have moved down there. It's the, it's the locals. It's the El Salvadorians have hope. Cause like you said, when you arrest the gangsters, everybody basically got a 30% pay raise cause they're not mm. paying extortion money every week. So everyone's like free and safe and happy. And it, it, it's, it's fantastic. So it's you great. Know, you saw the new library that they just opened up unreal right i told you like just two blocks from there you, you can buy a building for a hundred thousand bucks and open up your own comedy club i'm Grand. working on that max you know what the hell are you doing what's this I'm... rock rocket what what is this channel you know <laughs> where am i you could have your own yuck yuck clubs in el salvador i am Grand actively presents el salvador yuck yuck, yuck el salvador it's the new Times Square of Central America. They got they had fifty five thousand visitors the first week to that library. Wow. They could have all been at Graham Elwood's Yuck Yuck Club. <laughs> you get some laughs and a pupusa for for five dollars. What well, are you doing? What are you doing? Where are you? I'm just in trying Los to... Angeles. What's the I... place? Is a dump. Yes. Well, I tell you what, Max. If you can help me with some investors for Graham Elwood's Yuck Yuck Club, I'm down there tomorrow. <laughs> Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. I'm in. I'll do it. I'm in. Um, Max, thank you so much for being on our show, man. Tell Stacy I said hello. Tell everybody in El Salvador I said hello. And uh, we will talk to you very, very soon, my friend. Happy holidays. Bye. All right. Take care.